Well, we're into a new year and there's lots of good news on the horizon. We're going to have a better year than 2020. But hey, look back at the beginning of 2020, 12 months ago. We thought we were going to have a great year too and look what happened. But we can't have all those challenges again this year, can we? See, there's lots of good news. The economy's picking up. We've beaten the recession. It looks like we've contained the virus. And there's an earlier than expected arrival of a vaccine. And just seeing what's going on in the world, there's the path to normality has come along much faster than we expected. You know, hey, what happened to that fiscal cliff? It was merely a step down before we started to ascend, move up again, wasn't it? But amongst all the good news, there's some bad news. Some people have had health issues last year, others had financial challenges in 2020, and they're continuing on. So to increase your chance of financial success, and probably success in 2021, I'm going to have a chat today with two experts who are going to share their wealth building tips with you, as well as some lessons that they learned during the challenging times of 2020. I'm initially going to have a chat with Kate Forbes, National Director of Metropole, and then Ken Race, Director of Metropole Wealth Advisory, both my good colleagues and business partners. Now, in the month of January, most of us have got a bit of extra time up our sleeve. I know by the time you're going to be listening to this, I've actually pre-recorded it, of course, I'm going to be on vacation. So during the month of January, since you've got a bit of extra time, I'm going to be bringing you three shows a week rather than the normal two. One will be a new episode, just like this one, to help keep you up to date with what's going on. And then twice a week, I'm going to be republishing some of my most popular past episodes. Now, if you've got some extra time, why not go back and listen to some of the old podcasts? Find your podcast app and go back and... Look, I don't want to blow my trumpet too much, but I want to say that there's some great content in those old shows, not just from me, but from the many great guests I've had over the last couple of years. So today we're going to have two separate segments with some wealth building tips from two experts, and of course I'm going to share with you my mindset message. So welcome to this episode of the Michael Yardney Podcast. Welcome to the Michael Yardney Podcast, where twice each week you will learn a number of new ideas regarding success, property investment, and money in around 30 minutes. Our show is brought to you by Metropole, who specialize in helping you grow, protect, and pass on your wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. Now, here's your host, Michael Yardney, Australia's authority in wealth creation through property, who has been voted one of Australia's top 50 most influential thought leaders. Last year was another interesting year in property, wasn't it? While some investors have done very well, clearly others were having challenges with the coronavirus cocoon, the recession we had, and the finance challenges. So what lessons can we learn or relearn from 2020 to make our investment journey more smooth moving forward? The other questions I want to ask Kate Forbes, National Director of Property Strategy at Metropole. She's based in Melbourne, but she looks after our national team. Welcome, Kate. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for having me. Well, Kate, we chat frequently and we've both uh, had some good times in 2020 with our own investments. And I think the seeds we sowed in previous years has made that work for us and for many of our clients. But what lessons did you learn last year that you'd like to share with people? Well, Michael, you said it earlier, um, I think, and, and, and when you said relearn, because we all do know these these lessons, so they're not new to us. It's just a, a really good reminder and sometimes an unwelcome reminder that it's it's, it's useful to um, go to school and learn, learn those lessons in the first place. But um, the last time that you asked me this, this question, uh, my response was that the only certainty we have is that everything will change. And boy, was that true of 2020. Yes, at this time last year, we would not have anticipated all the things that we went through. We started the year on a high in property and with the economy. Uh, we had our lows and we've got to the high again. Who would have thought we would have experienced that? A year we're never going to forget. So I guess the, the reminder there for all of us is that every year there's an X factor. Um, and if we look back, I guess, over the last couple of years, there certainly have been um, a whole host of X factors in there. In 2018, we had changes to finance and depreciation rules, where it was always important to make sure that every last dollar of your borrowing capacity was working for you as hard as, leave, as it possibly could. Over the last few years, it became absolutely crucial. 
And then we had changes to depreciation and deductibility rules, which meant we had to tweak our strategies a little and I guess learn to roll with the, the punches. Now, of course, your long-term property investment strategy should always remain capital growth focused and fairly static in, in that sense. But uh, within that long-term strategy, you still need to roll with the punches and tweak things to adjust. Then we had 2019. And the X factor then was uh, the election concerns and fear, fears over changes that that might um, eventuate, the effects that that may have on the market, which did have a huge impact on market prices. So a significant X factor in that year as well. Now, just to make it clear for those who don't know, we're not talking about the music TV show, are we? We're talking about those Black Swan events, those events that were not anticipated, that you didn't think about, otherwise they wouldn't be an X factor. So I just wanted to make it clear because some of our millennial audiences probably aren't <laughs> aware of this term <laughs> and, and, and they think of that great show on TV that I only see in the background. I've actually never watched it properly. Almost as entertaining, but perhaps not quite as fun to go through. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but looking back on 2020, wow, what a year and what a reminder for all of us that we have no idea what the future holds. And in the face of that, we can only hope for the best, but we absolutely have to plan for the worst. And so perhaps the biggest reminder for me out of 2020, and as I wrote out um, 2020, one of the things I was exceptionally grateful for was um, insurance. Not a particularly sexy subject, but also not the sort of insurance that you're probably thinking of. So if, if I can just explain, firstly, I had a financial buffer to, to see me through. Things are bound to go wrong, and they're usually out of your control. So just like we urge our clients to, I had adequately provisioned for it and um, I was able to make sure that the portfolio that I have wasn't a casualty of not having those um, adequate financial buffers. Now, that was a really interesting lesson, Kate, because over the years when we've advised our clients not to use their limit, don't spend the last cent, have a buffer set aside, many of them poo-pahed that. They weren't sure. They were in such a hurry to build their portfolio. They didn't see the benefit of it, just like other insurance, until you need it. And when you need it, aren't you happy that it's there? Absolutely. Not only does it give you the ability to weather that storm, to hold on to the portfolio and, and to see that through, but it also gives you the ability to be able to sleep at night. And you can't put a price on that. Sure. The other insurance, I guess, that I had was in the form of quality assets. So I was safe in the knowledge that if everything came to the worst and I did have to sell the properties, or um, one of them, that there was a depth of market demand for my properties. They're in quality locations and they were desirable properties. Um, so I had that insurance or security behind me. And it also meant that because the properties themselves are, are so desirable, not only was the capital growth underpinned um, and assured there, but it also meant that I actually had um, reasonable tenants who were similarly able to weather the storm of 2020. And, and crucially, they were motivated to stay in the properties that I was renting to them and rather than moving to take advantage of um, the lower rents that were and still are abundantly being advertised out there. I guess that shows the importance of owning the best assets you can afford rather than just any asset, something we go on about a lot on this podcast and to our clients. But there is a flight to quality during these times for investors and for home buyers, which meant that quality properties in the good locations didn't drop in value, but those off the plan apartments or the apartments in the CBD or the house and land packages where there's no scarcity in the outer suburbs, they lost value considerably. In fact, I remember when we spoke and set our strategies for ourselves personally and for our clients at the beginning of last year, we hinted that A-grade properties would probably drop, well, more than hinted, we actually put it in writing and in public, that A-grade properties would probably only drop about 5%, while B-grade properties, ones with uh, not in the best location or something wrong with them, would maybe drop 10% in value, and C-grade properties would have real difficulty selling. And that's exactly how 2020 transpired. So there's probably a good lesson there too. Rather than just accumulating assets, only get 
diamonds. And I remember in one of the previous podcasts, Stuart Weems actually said, no, only get pink diamonds. And as a female, <laughs> as a lady, you'd probably appreciate that more than I would. <laughs> now, that was a sexist remark, Kate. You're not used to those from me. <laughs> Who doesn't love a pink diamond, though? <laughs> So what you were saying was that you had insurance in a number of different ways and it was in financial buffers and it was owning the right property. But as it happened, you didn't end up needing to use your buffers, did you? No, thankfully not. Um, so it, 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 I didn't have to tap into those, but having having that buffer there actually gave me the ability to position myself for the next purchase and to take advantage of um, some of the opportunities that the market did present over last year, it helped me to grow my portfolio at a, at a time when others were fearful. Well, that's interesting because I know your personal situation. While we won't go into detail, yes, you actually did buy a great property at a good time at the end of uh, last year, while others were still wondering, "Hey, have we gotten through the recession? Have we? Uh, uh, should should I buy? Shouldn't I buy?" Timing wasn't that important to you, was it? No, in in a long run strategy, it's a much greater focus on acquiring the best possible asset that you can at the best price that you can and sitting on it. Okay, so that was a long tip number one, having insurance, but it wasn't the insurance that you uh, or many people would have thought about. What's your second tip you'd like to share today? Um, I guess also a, a, another reminder, shall we say, that um, – it's perhaps not a reminder, but maybe a, a tweak on things. And, and in the past, it has often made sense for many of those who are just starting out to rent fest. It's certainly something we've spoken about um, in podcasts in the past and, and in, um, in print. But because of changes to stamp duty for eligible first home buyers, uh, because of the first home buyers deposit scheme, uh, first home owners grant, and, and some other tax benefits in there, it's um, also also being coupled with um, it often being very much easier to obtain finance for a home purchase rather than an investment purchase. When you put all of that all together, it's now making more sense for many to actually live in the property for at least the, the first year. Um, but there's a number of factors that obviously need to be considered before um, choosing to, to implement that yourself and we'd always urge you to seek an experienced advice before stepping into any of those strategies. So what I understand you're saying is don't just consider rent vesting, in other words, rent where you want to live and invest where you can afford, because the sums work out differently today with a number of things, holding costs are less, uh, the cost of owning a property is less, and boy, are there some great incentives. And that's one of the reasons the percentage of first home buyers is at record levels. It finished last year at record levels, and it's probably going to continue on this year as some of the government incentives continue on. But it's hard to do the numbers yourself. It's hard not to be emotionally involved. That's where it really is handy to have an outside person just making sure that uh, you're doing the right thing. It's also really important if you are um, pursuing all of those those uh, government grants and benefits there to not lose sight of making sure that you're actually purchasing the best asset that you can. Um, that's way more important than being able to take advantage of all of those um, those grants. That's actually a really good point because your first home is not going to be your forever home. And if you get it right, it'll be the stepping stone to buy other investments. And uh, you could probably even keep that as an investment. Uh, while if you don't get it right, it's going to hold you back. But that's another important factor because if you don't get your finance strategy right and you suddenly pay down all your home loan debt like your parents taught you to, it actually makes it very difficult to get the right finance structures if you're going to then move to another home. What I'm getting at is that if you buy your first home and you slowly pay off the mortgage and then you decide, hey, I'm going to buy another home, I'm going to keep my first one as an investment, when you take the equity out of your first home that will eventually become an investment, the loan, the purpose of the loan is to buy home number two, your principal place of residence, and it's therefore not tax deductible. So while you've been a good saver and uh, 
stashed your cash and paid down your mortgage, it's not the right structure if your first home isn't going to be your forever home. And in general, it isn't. So again, part of the reason that when we sit with clients, we actually understand where they are, where they want to be, what the steps are going to be, and the finance that they get and put in place and the structures that they put in place should be there, not just for purchase number one, but for purchase number two, three, and four, Kate. Indeed. And that's why we like to to work with finance strategists rather than um, than perhaps more order taking uh, brokers. Sure. And while the banks are offering low interest rates, that's not the sort of structuring advice you're going to get if you walk into the door of the bank. So again, the purpose of uh, this advice is to give you an understanding of what to watch out for. Kate, one more tip, please. One more. Well, I guess a reminder that uh, it's local factors that drive property market performance. And there's no such thing as the single market. So commentary on the Melbourne property market or the Brisbane property market really is of very little value. And 2020 was testament to that with hugely divergent moves depending on suburbs, let alone at a city specific level. Sure. So despite us all having the same tax system, the same interest rates, uh, basically the same government, certain property markets outperformed, but not just on a state basis, even within the state, certain segments uh, performed. So therefore, that broad commentary that we get in the media about the Melbourne property market doing this, or this year, 2021, the Melbourne property market's going to have performed this level and Brisbane's going to perform that level, doesn't really mean much, does it? No, not at all. If you have a look simply at um, units versus houses in the Melbourne market, huge divergence and huge divergence even within um, units in one part of Melbourne or one type of unit versus another. They, they're almost separate categories um, they're in, and, and should be separately measured. They're so divergent. Sure. So that, that was a good lesson. So your three tips to relearn, relearn were number one, protect yourself with the, well, actually the first one I think really was uh, the only certainty is change, wasn't it? So that therefore be prepared by protecting yourself with the right ownership structures, the right finance structures. Your second tip was be cautious about the concept of rent vesting. It may not be appropriate for you. Do numbers, sums and figures carefully. And the last one was, hey, there isn't one property market. Local factors drive the market performance. But now that I've had my turn, Michael, it's your turn. Perhaps you could share some of your your insights or takeaways from 2020. Ah, okay, putting me on the spot. Well, I think one of the things I learned, relearned, was that hindsight's a wonderful thing. Now, let me explain what I'm getting at. With the benefit of hindsight, knowing what you know now, if you had the opportunity to do so, would you have bought a property, investment property, 40 years ago, Kate? Sure, definitely. Sure. I mean, I bet your answer would be, of course it was, realising that in Sydney you would have probably had to pay $68,500 back then. In Melbourne, the median price 40 years ago, and I remember it because I was investing then, the median price of a Melbourne house was $40,000. But but let me ask you another question, Kate. If we had the benefit for hindsight and we were both back there in 1980 um, and you were just about to buy that property that you said, yes, of course I'm going to buy, uh, uh, knowing what you know now, but I told you, hey, in the next year or two, Australia is going to fall into a recession, Kate, uh, and in the next six years' time, negative gearing would be removed, only to be introduced a couple of years later. That's what happened in the 80s. And what if I was to tell you that there'd be a stock market crash, and make an amazing crash in 87, and a severe recession in the early 90s, meaning that the first decade of owning your first investment property, you'd have had to face all those headwinds. Knowing that, you maybe wouldn't have been as positive about buying that property back in 1980. Of course, with the benefit of my time machine, and you're still being back in 1980, uh, as you plan to buy that first property, I would probably also warn you that there was going to be an up coming AIDS scare. There was going to be a SARS pandemic. There was going to be an Asian financial crisis. We were going to meet September 11th, where we thought the world was going to come to an end. We were going to have a global financial crisis. And hey, in 2020, there'd be a corona-induced worldwide recession. Would you still have had the courage to buy that property in 1980? And I think the answer for most people If I said that to you and we were standing there then, you would have said, no, 
Why on earth would I invest in property knowing there's going to be so many challenges, so many problems, so many risks ahead? But of course, if you would have said no, you would have missed out on some amazing wealth building opportunities. And how do I know that? Well, I was already investing for about a decade back in 1980, and I did buy another investment property that year. I remember that. And over the years, the capital growth of my properties went up and it allowed me to keep adding my to my portfolio, meaning that today I've got a significant cash machine. It's given me the lifestyle choices that I was looking for back then. Now, of course, along the way, I'd made some good investments. I made some wins. And boy, did I make my share of mistakes. And I learned some lessons from them. But an important lesson I learned, Kate, so that's a long-winded way of answering your question, is don't try and time the market. Because there'll always be reasons not to invest, like all the ones I mentioned to you that you wouldn't have even known about. And then all the people who seem to come up with reasons. So people seem to have a vested interest, Kate, either a vested interest in telling you not to invest because they're trying to spoil the the, the desires, the, the, the aspirations of a lot of us fellow Australians. But also be careful, there's a whole lot of people out there in the market with a vested interest telling you to invest, and their vested interest is to sell their product or uh, sell a property or, or work as a marketer for other people. So be careful about who you listen to and get independent advice to help you move forward in these challenging times. So with the market moving forward now, not all properties are going to make investment grade properties. In fact, critical property selection is important. And buyers agents can help you select the right property, but they only know their particular area. Many property strategists only understand their patch. So I believe to be successful in 2020, you're going to need a more holistic approach, being able to marry together financial planning, wealth advisory, property management, value add where markets aren't going to do as well, strategic property advice and buyer's agency. And that's what I know your team at Metropole does, Kate. And uh, we've been very busy. 2020 was a good year for us. And already, uh, I, I know there's a lot of clients getting ready to take advantage of the new property wave. So if you'd like to have a chat with Kate or her team, why not go to metropole.com.au, find out about what we do, and have a, an obligation-free initial chat to discuss your options, to see how your property portfolio is going, to see how you plan if you've got a plan, is going to get you to where you've got to get to or if you need to change it. So, Kate, thank you for the time. Thanks for the chat. And uh, we, I mean, this is a chat formally. We chat all the time anyway, having offices next to each other. But we spent most of last year chatting virtually. It'll be fun working closer together with you again this year, Kate. Indeed. Always a pleasure to be, to be on here. Thank you, Michael. Well, we've just heard from one of the directors of Metropole, Kate Forbes, about her learnings or relearnings in 2020 to help become a better property investor in 2021. And now I'd like to have a chat with Ken Race, director of Metropole Wealth Advisory, another one of my business partners, who's had, well, almost as long in property as me. So, Ken, I'm sure you've learned more lessons and forgotten more than most people will ever know. Welcome, Ken. Thank you, Michael. It was a funny year last year, wasn't it? An unusual year, but we got through it. And I know that you had to help clients sort out their wealth, learn how to protect themselves, how to pass it on. It was a busy year for you and your team at Metropole Wealth Advisory. But if you could distill it down to a couple of tips to help people in 21, what would you suggest? Yeah, I think the lesson this year is nothing new from prior years. Unfortunately, people who don't get good advice tend to make the same mistakes over and over again. But what we've seen is strategic investors structure their purchases to protect their assets and maximise their cash flows, while most other investors put little thought into which entity they should use to own their assets, particularly property. Can they do eventually? They come back 10 years later and say, oops, I made a mistake. Can you fix it up? It's harder then, isn't it? It's harder and a lot more expensive because taxes are triggered. So it is cheaper, smarter and wiser to do it right in the first place. And as real estate is a long-term affair, the name in which you buy your property uh, investment can have a significant uh, impact 
when it comes to managing your future cash flows. So you've almost got to look at the end in mind and structure today with that. So the correct use of an appropriate trust to own your property gives you some flexibility, improved taxation outcomes, and allows you to efficiently manage changes in your personal circumstances, which we all know will occur at different points in your time. That's actually a good point, Ken, because over time, your requirements change, your cash flow changes, maybe your income levels change, yours may go up, your wife may stop working. And and so the structure you need maybe on day one, especially for beginning investors, is not always the structure that will be useful in the long term, but you've really got to begin with the end in mind and understand how you want to end up rather than where you are today, Ken. That's right, because as your life situation changes – and it could be in the personal sphere, getting married, having children, to your job where you might start off as a junior employee, you might then grow to a business owner, you inherently move into a more litigious path or an area where risk becomes more important. So it makes sense to set up the correct structures from the beginning to minimise those risks right from the very start. So putting all that together, what's your first tip? Look, my first tip for 2021 is really review your affairs to minimise risks. And those risks include, you know, financial. Do you have a financial buffer in place? Do you have a will and a power of attorney? Do you have sufficient life and income protection insurance? Are your assets in the right name? And what we find with a lot of clients is they for whatever reason, decide that the structure they've owned their assets in is no longer appropriate. And to change it can trigger a lot of taxes. But if we distill it down to why do they want to change, and if it is for asset protection, then there are strategies that can protect those assets in your personal name without triggering all the normal taxes such as capital gains and stamp duty. So they don't require refinancing. And can I say they're relatively simple and cost effective in the scheme of what you're trying to achieve, predominantly because you don't trigger the taxes. And if it's your family home, you don't lose that main residence exemption, which is quite a valuable thing. Now, these are really important. They're in fact critical, but they're what's left behind for most people, they don't get information until too late because they're not asking the right people. And if they are, they're not asking the right questions. So a lot of people go to a buyer's agent or a property strategist to get advice on buying their property, or they go to a mortgage broker, and sometimes they they go to a financial planner. But Ken, these people don't have the breadth and depth of knowledge. So tax accountants will be very good at at compliance and your solicitor will actually protect you and your financial planner will help you grow your wealth, but they they actually don't speak to each other. That's right. It's like um, there is no squeaky wheel, if you like, to get the attention. And that was very, very evident uh, in the year of COVID-19, which delivered unexpected and, can I say, very disadvantageous events that surprised many people in a very personal and financial way. But just as the health effects of COVID affected different groups in the community in a different way, so did their financial consequences because not everybody was affected to the same degree because of the lockdowns and recession. So while many investors and business owners suffered, some actually thrived during these difficult times. And in general, the biggest winners were those who had a plan that gave them flexibility and robustness in what they were trying to achieve. Ken, I guess those plans, though, were prepared before COVID. You've actually got to bring the future forward and plan for that, do something about it now. Correct. You need a plan. It's the same if you're going to build a building. You need the drawings. You need a solid foundation. And then you need a builder that's actually going to deliver what you have drawn. And unfortunately, in each one of those areas, it can fall through the cracks. So the people who had a plan before the onslaught of the challenges, can I call them the smart investors? Not that there's dumb investors, because investing is actually, um, you know, 80% of, of the issue because most people don't invest. But the smart investors had a framework 
to create certainty and direction for their financial well-being, particularly when times of uncertainty approached. So while nobody could predict the worldwide pandemic and certainly its severity and then the ensuing uh, recession, those strategic investors who managed to guide through the challenging times had a plan in place that was based on multiple inputs to create a personalised and robust plan and strategy, but it was flexible enough to cope with the unexpected when it does occur. So, so Ken, I know the plans that your team put together, that our, our clients at Metropole get, involve much more than just tax or structures, because I think people think that's what you specialise in and you do. There's asset protection, there's estate planning, there's cash flow management. That's become very important at the moment. It's interesting. I see a lot of people come to us at Metropole because they want more cash flow. They want to invest in property because they want more cash flow. The problem is if they haven't got their cash flow management right, taking on extra debt, taking on extra commitments doesn't actually help their cash flow management, Ken. It creates more problems in some ways, doesn't it? And so we help more than just with asset choices and improvement investment strategy. It's actually that holistic approach, putting all that together. Correct. And those strategic investors that look at tax structures, asset protection, estate planning, cash flow management, asset choice, they end up with, if you like, a a more robust system to actually grow their wealth. And what we're finding is to achieve those maximum outcomes requires a combination of all those various disciplines. Can I say from the beginning? Because if you go to one profession, you get their answer, which could be correct. But when you blend it in with another profession that's giving advice in another area, then the two heads butt together and they may not necessarily give you the best outcome. So what we found is the truly successful investors engage the services of someone that can guide them through the maze and ask the appropriate questions and know the options for review and then assist in the implementation. And most importantly, they know that if they're getting, can I say, the wrong end of the stick from uh, an advisor, they actually know that the information coming back is not necessarily to the client's best advantage and can then go back to that profession and say, but what if, what about this, what about that? So it's not only asking the right questions, It's someone who understands whether the right answer is coming back. And it's like in the old days when technology first started, it's garbage in, garbage out. So you've got to be able to identify when it's garbage coming out. That's interesting. I'm old enough to remember those expressions when people first started putting things into computers. So I guess what you're saying is that in general, the average investor in Australia, the average mum and dad doesn't have access to this. In America, I know the big people, Elon Musk, Bill Gates, they have what's called a family office. They actually have in their building, they've got their own account, they've got their own solicitor, they've got their financial planning team and their investment advisors, and they sit around a table and actually communicate with each other. That's the challenge that the average investor hasn't got because they can't afford that level of advice, Ken. That's right. So if we go back to the tips, you know, my big tip for 2021 is that all investors should have that holistic plan that maps out their journey to maximise their wealth creation, but will also protect it and help pass it on to the next generation. And that means they need the right structure for the business, the right structure to own assets, the taxation position, cash flows, having the correct loan structure. You know, one of the biggest mistakes I see is that people incorrectly set up their loan and therefore the tax man denies the tax deductibility. They don't have the right estate plan. I would say 80% of uh, wills that I see do not achieve what the person wanted. That's because they didn't know what to ask and they didn't know what to get back. They didn't understand their superannuation uh, options. So as important as it is to have a right plan, it's got to be prepared and administered, I think, by one central advisor to ensure that each piece fits together and that the different professionals are coordinated 
to achieve the objectives that you as the client want. So not surprising in this world, the ultra wealthy use those services. It's relatively new, as you said, in Australia and little known, but more and more people are starting to understand its value and therefore the costs have come down. So it's not a strategy or a service that's only available to the ultra rich. It's now becoming, if you like, part of the mainstream. If you know where to go and ask to get it at the right price and get the right delivery. Whereas in the US and Europe, it's been there for decades. So I think that's something everyday Australians must engage in. Start off with that holistic view. Manage yourself around that family office because it is your family you're trying to manage. And then leverage the expertise of a broad range of professionals with someone keeping them honest and accountable. Well, it gets back to what I've said so often on this podcast, that in today's environment, you need more than the buyer's agent. They're part of the team, but you need more than the property strategist. You need somebody to put a plan together. You need somebody who can offer holistic approach, put a team together for you to help you grow, protect and pass on your wealth. So they're two really good tips for 2021. Thanks, Ken. No, pleasure, Michael. Let me pass the ball to you and say, what is that one tip that you'd like to share with our listeners? If I'm not putting you on the spot, that is. Well, gee, there's so many, so many lessons, so many tips. Maybe one to bring up at this point would be to say that our property markets are fragmented. There's not one property market. I spoke with Kate about this recently the, in the first part of this chat where I was pointing out, but maybe I should clarify it a bit more, that Last year, 2020, it really showed the importance of how local factors drive the property market. Uh, moving forward, I think also uh, local economic performance, local job creation, local population movements are going to be the key growth drivers of our property markets. But even so, there isn't one Melbourne market or Brisbane market or, or Sydney market. There are multiple markets based on price point, geographic location, types of dwelling. And as Australia is working its way out of its economic challenges, that we've got through the recession now, some segments of our property markets are going to outperform. So already there have been all those forecasts for 2021 saying the Melbourne property market's going to have this sort of growth, Brisbane's going to have double-digit growth. Uh, but that's not the case. There are segments that are going to do well. And that's because in some segments of the population, they've got swelling disposable incomes. They've got falling interest rates. They've got multiple streams of income. Their property holding costs are lower. So at the end of last year, the figures showed that borrowers were better off than they'd been for years. But just as you said a moment ago, the health consequences affected us differently. Different groups in the community were more vulnerable to COVID-19. The economic impact and the resultant recession didn't affect us all equally either, Ken. Unfortunately, unemployment's risen, but the job losses really, Ken, were disproportionate, being in the more low-income earners, with the casual workers. And a lot of people lost their, their second job and their gig job. But many of those people, they weren't the typical homeowners. They were more likely to be tenants. This has meant our rental markets have suffered. They're going to continue suffering in the first part of this year. Vacancies are particularly high, obviously, in the inner city apartments. On the other hand, though, Ken, the studies have shown that 90% of Australians still have got a job and many of them are better off financially. They've got more disposable income than they've had for a long time, even if their wages haven't gone up. Uh, in the last couple of months, some uh, people have been getting a little bit more in their pay packet because of the newly introduced tax cuts. And at the end of last year, the Reserve Bank showed that credit card debt was wiped off. People paid down their credit cards, their charge cards, and at the same time, Many Australians are drowning in cash. They've stashed cash. Their savings rates dropped a little bit because they're now starting to spend it again. But household deposits were very, very high. All this means is as we move into 2021, certain segments of our property market, I believe those in the more affluent areas, are going to perform strongly because those people have got cash and the ability and the willingness to do something. But unfortunately, other segments are not going to do as well, Ken. You know, that's why it pays to get the right advice, buy the right asset in the right structure, finance it correctly, and use that as the platform to then leverage to the next asset and the next asset. So, sure, that's a really good point. 
You should be buying properties to buy more properties rather than as being an event. I think one of the things I'd recently mentioned uh, with Kate also was that buying an investment isn't an event. It's actually a process and it starts long before you buy it. So you've got to put your plan together. You've got to have your finance in place. So a lot of people think, oh, I'm going to buy an investment. No, you've got to do it in the right order, don't you, Ken? That's right. Uh, and it's the horse, what do they say, the, the horse before the cart. You've got to have the structure set up. You've got to know the, the loan. You've got to know your cash flow. You've got to understand your risk. Or else you're just throwing darts into a wall that uh, may not stick. So uh, very good uh, tips there, Michael. Well, if people want to have a chat with you, there's going to be a link in the show notes. But if you go to metropole.com.au and look under Wealth Advisory, you'll get an understanding of what Ken and his team does. And while many people would say, oh, it's only for high net worth clients, and to be blunt, most of your clients are, it's also there are services for average Australians, normal mums and dads to actually get the advice before it's too late. So if you go to metropole.com.au and look under Wealth Advisory, you'll find all about Ken or there'll be a link in the show notes. Thanks for your time today, Ken. Thank you, Michael. Now here's Michael's mindset message. Remember, a change in your thinking will lead to a change in your life. In my mindset message today, I'd like to share with you a letter written by the late George Bush, the 41st President of the United States. When he died in 2018, a letter of advice he'd written to young people did the rounds of the internet. Now, you don't have to be a young person to appreciate this advice. In fact, I think it's excellent advice for all of us, especially at this time of the year. The letter said as follows, I can't single out the one greatest challenge in my life. George Bush went on to say, I've had a lot of challenges and my advice to young people might be as follows. Don't get down when life takes a bad turn. Out of adversity comes challenge and often success. He went on to say, don't blame others for your setbacks. When things go well, always give credit to others. Don't talk all the time, said George Bush. Listen to your friends and mentors and learn from them. Don't brag about yourself, said George Bush. Let others point out your virtues and your strong points. Give somebody else a hand. When a friend's hurting, show that friend you care. Nobody likes overbearing big shots. As you succeed, be kind to people. Thank those who helped you along the way. And don't be afraid to shed a tear when your heart's broken because a friend is hurting. Say your prayers. And that was signed by George Bush. Well, there are some words from an elder statesman. I hope you found them inspiring. Well, there you have it. Some great wealth building tips for 2021 from a couple of experts and my mindset message about success. Now, if you got some benefit from this, if you learn something, why not pass the message on? Just like I'm trying to help you and as many people as possible to make 2021 a good year, just use the share button on the podcast app or I'd really love it if you told the world by leaving a review on Spotify or iTunes or wherever you listen to this podcast. Now, you can catch up with me in between the shows on social media, including the Property Update Facebook group. Just look for the Facebook group called Property Update, where I regularly, for this closed community, leave exclusive commentary. And I'll be back this month, three times a week. Look forward to catching up with you real soon. In the meantime, have a great week. Make it a great week. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Michael Yardney podcast, which was brought to you by Metropole, who help their clients grow, protect and pass on their wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. If you like what you heard and don't already subscribe, you'll find us on iTunes or on your favorite Android app as the Michael Yardney podcast. Watch out for our next show, which comes to you twice a week, and you'll learn some new ideas about property investment, success and money in around 30 minutes. To get more of Michael's thoughts, go across to www.propertyupdate.com.au and sign up for his daily morning briefing and you'll hear from not only Michael, but a group of leading property success and money experts. And just a reminder that the information you heard in this show today is general educational advice and not specific investment advice, as we don't know your personal circumstances. If you're looking for specific advice, why not ask the team at Metropole to help you? 